زيك خلقك الحمد لله ما حد بياخذ منك رزقك هدي وارتاح تابر وارمح من حقك بس بلاش العين لا 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 ما تسوى الدنيا بضيق خلقك الحمد لله ما حد بياخذ منك رزقك هدي وارتاح تابر وارمح من حقك بس بلاش أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا دخلوا في في السلم كافة صدق الله العظيم فضيلة الشيخ شيخ محمد بن يحيى الننوي our respected guest in this beautiful city of Cape Town my dear friend and leader شيخ إبراهيم غيبريل and all the علماء of Cape Town who are present and from all over the world protectors of our Quran, leaders of our community, leaders of all faiths who are present, my dear brothers and sisters, fellow Kryptonians, good evening and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. It is a wonderful feeling to be back in Cape Town and I know that I should return very soon, insha'Allah, if Farid Sayyid feels it necessary to regurgitate my entire history, <laughs> it makes me feel that I am now a stranger again. <laughs> but the point that he makes at the end, <coughs> that for the last six years that I have been based in Washington, but essentially traveling the world, I have had the opportunity as founder of the World for All Foundation that strives to create an inclusive, dignified world for all creation, safe for difference and free of extremisms. This has certainly taken me to so many different corners of the world and I have used my life in Cape Town and my existence as a Muslim that is in South Africa to draw my inspiration not only from the great leaders that we have produced in this country, like Nelson Mandela, but the great Muslims who have kept the Deen Islam alive despite many odds, the odds of slavery, the odds of colonialism, the odds of segregation, the odds of apartheid, and who have survived an enormous transition from apartheid to democracy to ensure that this part of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will always be an Ummah that will be envied by the Ummah throughout the world. 1,6 billion Muslims envy the freedom we have, envy the democracy we live in, and envy the human rights we enjoy because the Ummah is in pain. My dear brothers and sisters, I have been and met with members of the Syrian opposition that our Sheikh has spoken about with so much sadness. I have met with the brothers and sisters of the Ikhwan, particularly from Egypt, where their rights were taken away in a coup d'etat. I have met with those in Bahrain where Shia and Sunni have been fighting each other and they too yearn for reconciliation that have come so easily to us. I have met with people in Turkey, because Turkey has become the crossroads of the Muslim world. Whoever is in pain have gone to Istanbul. And they all ask one simple question, how can South Africa help? And therefore, tonight we come here to say that when Sheikh Nanawi brings the Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies, and at IPSA, we have the al Shatibi Chair for Maqasidi Studies, these are not accidents of history. These are the Muslim world's thinkers coming to Cape Town to say, we need to draw on the inspiration of your 350 years, and we have the gift to give to the Muslim world and to end the pain that is there so that no part of the Ummah is able to make the mistakes that we have made at the beginning. They must learn from the lessons that we have set.
And therefore, when you listen to all these Muslims, you almost hear the cry that goes up as the cry of the early Muslims in Mecca under the leadership of our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam when they raised their hands to the heavens and they shouted, Mata Nasrullah, when is the help of Allah coming? And Allah's promise is clear, Nasrum min Allah wa fathum qareeb. Help from Allah will come and a speedy victory. And we must hold on to that promise, but we must not wait till it descends from the heavens to us because the help is within us and the victory will come from our own understanding of what that victory is. Because when Allah issued the invitation to us, when Allah says to us, Ya ayyuhallavina amanu, Allah says to us, Oh, you who believe, enter into Islam, enter into Silm, enter into peace wholeheartedly, perfectly, and completely. And why is it then that we second guess ourselves about what we are invited to? Why is it that we want to make a fetish and we want to worship violence? When there is definite injustice done to us. Why is it that we begin to doubt the DNA of our religion? Why is it that we have given the right to define our religion to the least deserving amongst us? Those on the furthest margins of the ummah. They shape the image that goes to the world. They shape the message that goes to the world. And we who pray every day, who we give sadaqah every day, who we pay our zakah every year, we who fast as much as what we can outside of Ramadan, we, the 1,6 billion, stand silent and allow them to dictate the terms to us. And when Sheikh Nanawi comes here and launches the center that we launched tonight, the message must go out to every corner of the world and every corner particularly of the Muslim world that we tonight are correcting a crime, a set of crimes that were created because the first crime was the crime of a hijacking, the, the hijacking of our faith from us. The second crime that we come to make correct is to set free the hostages. The 1,6 billion Muslims have been made hostage of what is going on in Raqqa in the name of a so-called Khalif. And the third crime is the crime of disfigurement, as if someone has thrown acid onto the face of the ummah and disfigured us and distorted who we are. And we come here tonight to say, we are fixing that crime. We are taking back our faith. And we are not inventing concepts. We are reclaiming concepts. Because when we say we are Muslims, we are followers of the Deenul Islam. The word Islam, vertically, in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is an act of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala known and no other dictator and no other power on earth. But that same concept, Islam, after we've established the vertical relationship with Allah, we establish the horizontal relationship and we give peace to humanity. Not violence to humanity. Not death to humanity. And when... We say that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our vertical relationship of that belief in Allah is that Allah is one. Allah is indivisible. Allah is a unity. Wa ilahukum, ilahu wahid, and your Lord is one single undivided God. And when we spread it on earth horizontally, we say, Kana nasu ummatukum. Ummata Wahid. This whole of humanity is one single community, unfragmented, undifferentiated, without discrimination, except in conduct. And when we profess that we follow the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the unity of Allah, we have entered into a relationship of Iman. Vertically. Iman means that we believe in Allah even though we have not seen Allah. But we believe in the attributes and we strive after it and we submit to Allah. Horizontally, Iman transforms into Aman, security. We give security to people. 
We don't fatten them. We don't make them fearful. We don't give them anxiety about who we are. We in fact show them the beauty and say, you too enter into relationships of Iman with Allah and Aman with humanity. And once we have established our Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we look for the leader. And the leader is our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you love Allah, then follow Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the vertical. But the horizontal is, rahmatul lil alameen. A mercy unto all of humanity. Giving compassion to all creation. Not threatening them. Not being harsh with them. Not being judgmental. And not making harm to people. It is mercy and compassion that we spread horizontally on this earth. And once we have tied ourselves to the leadership of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we then join 1,6 billion other people called the Ummah. This Ummah that Allah describes vertically as khayra Ummah. The best of people evolve to humanity, not unconditionally, not just by saying I believe, but because you believe, and because you do right, and because you forbid the wrong, then you are khayra ummah. Horizontally, it means ummatan, wasatan. It means an ummah that occupies the center, that stays in the middle, that is most middlemost, and shuns the extremes. We can't glorify the extremes. We can't glorify the edges of the ummah. We can't glorify the margins of our community. We've got to glorify and build the center because that is where we are anchored and that is where the source of our leadership in the world comes from. It comes from the center and not from the edges. And unfortunately, we have given it to the edges and we have vacated the center and we must reclaim the center because that is what the world looks for today. And once we have said that we are part of this glorious ummah, we ask ourselves, who are we? And we are khilafatullah fil ard. Not victims of Allah on earth. Not victims of Zionism on earth. Not victims of imperialism on earth. Not victims of the West on earth. Not victims of America on earth. We are khilafatullah fil ard. Agents, vicegerents of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth. We, do, we may be victims of aggression of occupation. We may be victims of Islamophobia and discrimination, but we don't put on the clothes of victimhood. The fundamental difference is that a victim cannot decide how to go forward. A victim is driven by those who victimize. Allah never lets us suspend our thinking, never lets us suspend our agency, never lets us suspend our will. Because it is our will and our agency that makes us different from every other creation. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted more angels without the will, Allah would have created more angels. If Allah wanted more uncritical worship, Allah would have created more trees and animals. But Allah created us with one distinctive thing, that we have free will. And we must never give it up to anyone on earth. Not our enemies and not those who claim our religion from us. And therefore, we need to be able to reclaim who we are. Of course, Allah demands of us also that if this world is to be held together in harmony and in balance, then kunuka wa amina bil kist shuhada alillah, then stand out firmly as witnesses to Allah for justice. Why does Allah say this? Because Allah tells us that had Allah not checked or used one group of people to stop another group from doing wrong, the earth would have been filled with mischief. So we must stop those who make mischief on the earth, whether from within or without. Allah goes further to say that had Allah not checked one set of people by means of another, then you would have seen the destruction of monasteries, of churches, of synagogues, of masajid, all the places 
where Allah's name is celebrated abundantly. Have we not seen this come to pass? Have we not seen a bishop slaughtered in his church in France? Have we not seen Shias bombed to death on Karbala? Have we not seen Sufis destroyed on Miladun Nabi? Is this not what Allah has predicted? And is it not done in the name of a pure Islam according to some interpretations? And so peace is not a luxury. Nonviolence is not a luxury. We must remove it from the DNA of the Deen islam and not from the Deen islam from the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And so my respected brothers and sisters, of course we must now stand up for justice. And that's why Allah gives the second iteration of that verse. When Allah says, even if it is against yourself, how much credibility is there when we want justice in Palestine, but we can't stand up for justice for Sufis, for Shias, for Christians, and for other people? What's the credibility of it? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes further in the further iteration of that, and let not the hatred of a people to you swerve you from justice. Because you believe the Zionists hate you, does not give you a license to depart from justice. Because you think Americans hate you, does not give you a license to depart from justice. Because you think that NATO hates you, does not give you a license from just, to depart from justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the character of Muslims is, when they are angry, even then they are merciful and forgiving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, through the tongue of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa my mercy precedes my anger. If that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets the Prophet to say to us, who are we to say that my anger precedes my mercy? So, assalamu alaikum. With me now I have the former Western Cape Premier and Ambassador to the US, Mr. Ibrahim Rasul. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Ibrahim. Shukran for being with us on ITV. Thank you very much. Um, Ibrahim, can you tell us more about what is extremism and how do we deal with extremism both from a violent and non-violent perspective? Extremism is a phenomenon that is built into the world that we live in. It's a world of uncertainty, it's a world of competing dogmas, and it's a world in which the very value of faith is under siege. And therefore from within, say for example, faith communities, cultural communities, or any other ideology, the potential for extremism um, is always close to the surface. Extremism has two forms. It is either inert, or as Sheikh Nanawi calls it, a non-violent extremism, it's what you think, what you say, what you believe and what you hold in your heart. Or it is violent extremism or what I call virile extremism. It is one that picks up arms, does harm to people, kills and maims. And sometimes most of them that have come recently have come out of um, the community and hijacked the religion of Islam for that. But extremism um, is also a phenomenon that could either be located in the mainstream of society and so there are certain governments in the world um, I regard the George W. Bush government as an extremist mainstream state driven extremism I regard Netanyahu's government in Israel as very much similar on the other hand um, a lot of the extremism in the name of Islam have been on the margins of society informal and scrapping it out um, and doing terror uh, for it. And so if we don't understand extremism in its comprehensive form, we will misunderstand what the phenomenon is that we are um, dealing with. And um, with regards to media, what role or how much of a role does media play in the rise of terrorism and how it shapes the narrative of extremism? You see, we must understand that in the media environment, you have various newspapers competing for a diminishing pool of readers. Then you've got print media competing with the more instant media that comes from the electronic sources, TV and radio. Then you've got those two traditional medias competing with social media that gives by the minute opinion posturing as news. So this is a highly fragmented and highly competitive environment and so each one wants to do something to grab the attention of the reader and they don't mind that truth is a casualty. 
and therefore um, they look for the sensation. The outrageous makes news. The, um, the, 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 the people don't want news that is first analyzed. As it breaks, they want it. And so their first opinions are formed, and those are often the most dangerous opinions are formed. And so, for example, they just now need to say, in 15 seconds, a Muslim terrorist has killed 50 people. And that soundbite is enough to drive an Islamophobic agenda, and then on the other hand, to give a triumphalism to extremists, and then to invite the state to retaliate and go and bomb a place. And so I think that the media wars that are fought are primarily within the media group for competing for, 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 the, um, for the readership and listenership and viewerships. But the cost has been that a complex world has been dumbed down and people are the casualties because they become the victims of bigotry. Shukran so much for your time and sharing that with us on ITV. <laughs>
also told them that he had, open quote, not come to bring peace, but the sword, end quote, in Matthew 10.34. And that, open quote, he who does not have a sword should sell his cloak and buy one, end quote, end quote, as in Luke 22.36. The same Quran that warns believers that, open quote, if you kill one person, it is as though you have killed all of humanity, end quote, in 532, also commands them to, open quote, kill the idolaters wherever you find them, end quote, 95. How a worshiper treats these seemingly conflicting commandments, at a superficial level, obviously they're conflicting, depending on the interpretation. If you're a violent misogynist, you will find plenty in your scriptures and textbooks to justify your beliefs. If you are a peaceful, democratic feminist, you'll also find justification in the scriptures for your point of view, and so on. Religion has often been painted as the cause of all major wars in human history. In fact, the causes of conflicts and wars are usually greed, envy, and ambition. But in an attempt or in an effort to sanitize them, these self-serving emotions have, been, have often been cloaked in religious rhetoric. Though not a new phenomenon to humanity, there has been much flagrant abuse of religion in recent years. Violent extremists have used religion to justify atrocities that violate its most sacred values. One of the chief tasks of our time must surely be to build a global community in which all peoples can live together in mutual respect. Yet religion, which should be making a major contribution, is seen as part of the problem. All faith systems insist that unconditional compassion is the test of true spirituality and religiosity, and that it connects us to the creator of all. Each has formulated its own version to achieve that. Islam's formula is simple. Hadith al-Imam Muslim fi sahihihi, man la yarham la yurham. He who is not compassionate unto others is ineligible to receive compassion. Treat people the way you want to be treated. If you're good to those who are good to you, then what good are you? Basic things that Islam came and commanded us to do. Yet sadly, we hear little about nonviolence these days and these kinds of foundational principles that Islam brought. You hear it today that, uh, that most religious leaders act like secular politicians, singing the praises of their own denomination and decrying their rivals with scant regard for charity. In public sermons and teachings, they speak rarely about nonviolence and unconditional compassion, but focus instead on secondary matters or their own cult-like interpretations, or abstruse doctrinal formulations implying that a correct stance on such issues is the criterion of true faith. Yet it is hard to think of a time when the nonviolence voice of religions has been so sorely needed, when the peace voice of religion has been so sorely needed. Our world is dangerously polarized today more than ever. There is a worrying imbalance of power and wealth, and as a result, a growing rage, malaise, alienation, and humiliation that has erupted in terrorist atrocities that endanger us all. We are engaged in extremism, violent and nonviolent alike, and in wars that we seem unable to end or to win. Maybe it's meant to be that way, I don't know. I'm not a politician, I can't answer that question. Disputes that were secular in nature 
or in origin, have been allowed to fester and become holy. And once they have become sacralized, positions tend to harden and become resistant to pragmat pragmatic solutions. And yet at the same time, we are bound together more closely than ever before through the media, internet, communication, commuting throughout the world, suffering and want, are no longer confined to distant, disadvantaged parts of the globe. We all live in a global village. Now, as Muslims, I always feel, again, we get, both end, we get burnt by both ends of the stick, the stick. On one aspect, there is lots of violence in the name of religion. In another aspect, Muslims constitute today the largest numbers of refugees in the world due to violence that they didn't choose but was imposed onto them. Muslims constitute today the largest numbers in the world of victims of wars. Muslims constitute today the largest numbers of victims of violence in the world. The irony in all that is that they are viewed as a disruption to an otherwise calm and content world. There's something that needs to be done. And maybe there is a narrative. I'm not going with Francis Fukuyama or others with the clash of civilization. But maybe there is a narrative that's been put out there that there is actually a clash of civilizations and that we need to move to one global civilization. That narrative is carried by Islamophobes, extreme Islamophobes, and by uh, extremists on the Muslim side together. That it's a war between Islam and Muslims and everybody else in the world. That was not reflected by the Prophet Wasallam's mission, nor by the the, the Quran, nor by the authentic prophetic ahadith, nor by examine the constitution of Medina, if you like, and see what it is. It's not about the clash of civilization. Islam wants us to build or to contribute to a civilization of love. Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, la tastawil hasanatu wa la sayyia. Evil and good, Quran says, the meaning of it, are not the same. Idfa' billati hi ahsan. Push and do that which is good. In other words, it doesn't matter what the others do. You're not a set of values of reactions to what others do and injustices that you cite that others do, and hence you need to do it also in the same magnitude. We don't repel evil with evil, but repel evil with good. And that's something that the Quran taught us, and that's what the Prophet ﷺ did. It is about standing up to a fringe, small fringe of extremists and their supporters. So what's the mission? Why did Medina Institute uh, thought about the Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies. In fact, those of you who have been around Medina Institute for more than 15 or, or so years now, and I know in South Africa it hasn't been that long, it's been probably maybe about four years or five years or so, but Medina Institute has always been in, in the United States from the 1990s, has always had this approach because I strongly believe and we strongly believe that it is absolutely prophetic to be nonviolent. In fact, that nonviolence is a fundamental Islamic principle. It's a foundational Islamic principle. So, what's the mission of the center being part of Medina Institute? Number one, to explain the Muhammadan nonviolence models. Uh, you've, we in the world, we talk about nonviolence models today. We talk about the Gandhi nonviolence, we talk about Jesus' example of nonviolence. And in the U.S., we also talk about Martin Luther King's uh, Junior's nonviolence example. Uh, uh, we here, obviously, I've, I've mentioned that earlier today, 
uh, that it's, it's important to consider President Nelson, Nelson, Nelson Mandela, the father of the nation, as also a contributor to that school of nonviolence that existed. The choices could have been really grim. And he had to make hard choices, I believe. And I believe in, deep in my heart, he made the right choices. <laughs> Well, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, provided us a complete model of nonviolence and peace. And I've, I'm just done with a 400 page manual from only Quran and authentic prophetic hadith on the prophetic methodology of nonviolence and peace facing violence. And uh, the few, there's only few uh, narratives, either historical or not necessarily authentic, that may contradict that, and the inauthentic can never compete that, with that which is authentic. That's one. Uh, we'll see also that the re, the, among the mission, or in, in the mission of the, of the Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies, is to be able to challenge robustly the ideas of those extremists. Violent and nonviolent, and I, to me, nonviolent extremism is much more dangerous than violent extremism. Violent extremism is already diagnosed. As a physician, I can tell you that to have something uh, that's diagnosed is much easier than to look for the, for the appropriate diagnosis. And sometimes the diagnosis could be very, very, very difficult because of the confounding effects that surround uh, diagnosing such issues. Nonviolent extremism is that hate speech, that, uh, you know, the competition and the rivalry between people and figures and organizations lead to sl slandering them, labeling them in different ways. This is the origin of violence. This is nonviolent extremism, and this is more dangerous than violent extremism because it's just a ticking time bomb. There's a problem. There's a, obviously, from an Islamic point of view, we believe this to be satanic origin. There's a shaitan in there, and if that shaitan is not neutralized, then it's going to be violent. It's just a matter of time. That's all. To be able to robustly challenge the ideas of extremists who seek to undermine the nature of our religion, because they, they want to live or they want to make a living or whatever it is or have a name or a fame and also seek to challenge our way of life. The key is to prevent individual be, individuals being attracted to both violent and nonviolent extremism. That's part of the Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies as far as its mission. Also, to contribute to the building of strong communities, confident in themselves, open to others, and resilient to extremism in all its forms. Also, to present Islam to all through the mandated foundational Islamic principles that are two, nonviolence and la ikrah. La ikrah means no coercion in the religion. These are both fundamental Islamic principles, nonviolence and no forcing. No pressure in an attempt, obviously, to win the hearts and minds of all people, whether they like you or don't like you, agree with you or don't agree with you, makes no difference. To teach people that nonviolent choices are much harder to make and take much more courage than the calls for violence, the instinctive calls to use instinct and do what they did to you. Allah did not stop at the Quran but at ordering us to treat each other justly. Otherwise, an eye would actually end up for an eye. And that turns most of the world blind. But Al Quran says, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli, and immediately put Al Ihsan. Not just Adil, not just just. Just is important as a first step. It must be secured. You can build on it. You can't build on, no, on injustice. But once you know that justice is there, Al-Islam says, Ihsan, you got to forgive. 
you got to forgive. You got to let go. And therefore, the choice is not just to justice. Justice, everybody wants that. The hard choice to make is when you have justice, you treat others better than they have treated you. That's the challenge. And that's where the Prophet وسلم, tells us in Sahih al-Bukhari Muslim, both narrated the hadith on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa laysa shadidu bis-sur'a. The tough one is not the one who acts violently in return, in, in a reaction, but the one who actually dissolves his anger, doesn't act based on anger. All right, so that's basically the concept. How do we do that? What's the way? How does Medina Institute promote, first of all, as you all know, Medina Institute is an academic Islamic institution. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, well, we do that through education, 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 and the fourth oh, option, also education. More education, more education, building critical thinking, not just education as imitation, as just reading a textbook with not understanding what it is. It's to have the culture of no question is off the table that figures are not really the standard. It doesn't matter who they are behind after the Prophet ﷺ. The standard is the Qur'an and the authentic prophetic sunnah. And all figures must adhere to that standard. <laughs> to identify patterns in cult formation rather than deen participation. Deen is open to all, but cult want to set you against everybody else, even want pe sorry, people of your own deen, people of those who believe the same like you. These are important things. And again, I say, we need to invest in education more and more and more. Uh, Medina Institute USA has been, alhamdulillah, three months ago, we've got a letter of approval by the Department of Education to be a degree-granting institution, bachelor's, master's, and PhD. <laughs> And I'm already supervising about two PhD students in the line of Islamic nonviolence models as we speak today. In addition, as you all know, we have full accreditation uh, uh, agreements with two universities in Malaysia for our masters and our PhD studies as well. And we want to get people to education, no matter what it is. We're asking community leaders to help. We're asking people to help, to step in. Everything matters. I'm not trying to ask you to pay money here. All I'm saying is we are actually doing everything. People put their, their futures on, on the side to actually advance the cause of Muslims who are misunderstood by some of their own and misunderstood by others. No matter what the cost, no matter how expensive education it is, there's always justification for higher education. If you think education is expensive, try ignorance. <laughs> this is what we're dealing with today. We're dealing with little knowledge or ignorance and guess what little knowledge hurts because people cannot see beyond their nose and that's what we're dealing with education through workshops seminars courses we're working with the university of pretoria in fact we're going there in a couple of days to advance such cause for everyone medina institute while it is a tertiary islamic education that, that, that teaches Islam, but it's not just open for Muslims. I have Jewish and Christian students in the United States studying at Medina Institute. Everyone knows the conscience of the Ummah, but the community and faith leaders are not always able to convey their arguments to those uh, who need to hear it, and more importantly, to those who are vulnerable to violent extremist messages. And that's very important. We need to deliver fully accredited, continuous professional development programs for faith leaders. And we're working with that with, in the U.S. independently as Medina Institute, in, in Malaysia with the, in, um, uh, with the Islamic University of Malaysia, and we're working also with the University of Pretoria on trying to develop these fully accredited. And obviously you get the, uh, not only the association and the exchange, but you get also to, to experience the prestigious 
and the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the solid academic teaching that is at UP or University of Pretoria. Also, we need to establish a frame of minimum requirement for imams of pre and preachers. In other words, we need to do imam qualification, something about that, not to be an official g uh, governing agency. That's not who we are. We don't do these things. But that we provide something like that. If you want, let's look at this. It's still, still until today, we have lots of imams. I'm talking about the US. I don't know exactly the South African context. But we import them from overseas, from third world countries uh, that don't primarily speak English. It takes them about 10, 15 years to learn the language, and another 10, 15 years to learn the contextual use of the language. Meanwhile, I've lost 30 years to prep these people for what they need to serve in the community. You have great, sharp, smart, intellectual, well-off, uh, and uh, academically, intellectually, South African Muslims. There is no need for you to import people from outside. You make your own homegrown religious leaders that not only understand their religion, but understand the South African struggle and context. Because we don't want people to bring their priorities from different places. And this way, obviously, this infragment or fragment the entire community. All I want to say is, look, at the end of the day, the, the, the reason for Medina Institute's nonviolence and peace studies is that we believe as humans, we are all one family. We're not the judge over other people's creed. That's not what we do. We did not, Allah the Creator, did not equip us to judge our own ends, let alone other people's ends. In Islam, actually, we view everybody out there that's walking, that's Muslim or non-Muslim, as potential wali of Allah. Because all it takes is a split second, and that person is amongst the most pious friends of God. So we see people out there that are either awliya of Allah or potential awliya of Allah regardless who they are, regardless what their faith is. The reason for the Medina Institute Center and non, for Nonviolence and Peace Studies is because the prof, trying to realize the prophetic wish, a wish for a better world. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Okay. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, can you tell me regarding the center, how can one get involved and what, how, does it, how does the center benefit the majority of South Africans, not only Muslims? Uh, the, cent the Medina Institute Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies is open for all, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. It will offer degrees, uh, certificates, uh, seminars, workshops about nonviolence and peace studies because they contribute to a better world and that's the prophetic our prophet muhammad sallallahu mission was a better world and this is exactly what we're trying to do so to fudge the gaps finesse the differences with everyone and try to have to improve the quality of living for all people living in south africa and all people of the world basically our vision is pushing towards rather than the theory of clash of civilizations pushing for a civilization of love that's what we try to do Shukran Sheikh for sharing that with us and inshallah may Allah grant you we'll send to all the success inshallah. I mean, thank you and you too as well. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> الدنيا تضيق خلقك الحمد لله ما حد بياخذ منك رزقك هدي وارتاح تابر وطمح من حقك بس بلاش العين لا 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 ما تسوى الدنيا تضيق خلقك الحمد لله ما حد بياخذ منك رزقك هدي وارتاح تابر وطمح من حقك بس بلاش